So this VC methods question is from Finn and it's about how to answer open style and methods questions in general. All of the sacks this year have to be open style, as in not leading us through each question, rather having to know what information is required in a given question, rather having to know what information is required in a given question. Okay, kind of understand that, but not really. Hopefully the rest clarifies it. How do we tackle open style questions? I feel I'm relatively competent at the theory. However, I get stuck very quickly when doing open style questions and uh, don't know where to start or what to do first. Example, factor, takeout, highest common factor, simplify, rearrange, substitute a value, ETC, thank you in advance. Um, okay, I'm trying to just break down this question in my head and see you know, what, you're at, what you're trying to ask. Because like this open style question is... That's like, you could argue that's most questions, right? It's not asking for, like it is asking for a specific answer, but it's not leading you towards a different way. So I've talked about this in previous videos, but if you just practice things from the textbook, everything is super organized. So if you just pick, pick topic 1E in, or chapter 1E in the textbook, you know exactly what it is. So you can answer that question because you know what topic it comes from. But when you do an exam, you don't know what topic it comes from um, apart from the information that's given to you. So you have to read a question and know what topic it's relating to and then link that back to the thought process that you've developed for that specific type of question. And it can be hard because you don't, if you just work from the textbook, then you don't have experience with, you know, just getting random questions and, you know, seeing how to answer it. So that's where actually doing full length practice exams and full length practice sacks becomes very useful because you can practice that skill of, if you see a question, then you can answer it without thinking about what, um, what chapter you're working through or what exercise you're working through in the textbook. So yeah, relatively competent in theory. However, I get stuck very quickly when doing open style questions. Very common mistake and a very common thing to happen. And there's two people that kind of, there's two different types of people that say this. The first one is a type of person who, I, I'm not saying this is you, Finn, but there's two the first person is someone who thinks that they know the theory, but they don't actually. They've kind of just worked through the textbook and can answer some questions with assistance, but not necessarily be a quote unquote master of the theory. So I'm, I'm sure that's not you. I see that you're very open in the forum and you're asking a lot of questions so, um, and very active. So I'm sure that you um, have worked through this theory and you know it well. So I don't, I believe you when you say you're relatively competent. Um, but yeah, it's only the start of the year, but just when you're going through, when you start going through Saxon exams, like you should be completely competent and know everything back to front as much as you can. You don't, you can't know everything back to front, but know as much as you can in the amount of detail, in the amount of detail that they have in the textbook. So the textbook is a perfect gauge for um, knowing what you need to know and what you don't need to know, because if it's not in the textbook, then you most likely don't need to know it. Um, but don't, a lot of people fall into this trap of thinking that, oh, it's not like, it's so, this question doesn't make sense. I've never learned this, which is a lie. Because if you haven't learned something, it's not necessarily because they're meant to teach it explicitly. It's meant to be a surprise and it's meant to be an application of something that you have already learned. And that happens a lot where people think that, um, yeah, things aren't taught, but everything is taught, obviously, because they, you know, everything has to be possible, right? It's just, a, it's just the fact that it's an application problem and the, the skills that you need are hidden in a certain way. And that, and you know, knowing how to do these questions comes through mastery of the theory, but then also exposure to different types of application problems, and then also refining your thought process as well. So working step by step to figure out, um, you know, what's actually needed to answer a question. Um, I talked about it. If you watch, if you watch this video that's tagged in this comment here from Nathan, I go through a really short example of an exam two type question and talk through, you know, like the ideal thought process for that question and how to apply that same thought process to other types of questions as well. So how to tackle open style questions. First of all, yeah, watch that, watch that previous video by Na on Nathan's post and look through the thought process part of that video. But what I would say in general is that you need to spend a lot of time refining specifically for SACs and just application questions in general. And you can't do it topic by topic. You have to do it as like a group. And there's lots of places to get resources for that. On our forum, we're going to be posting um, SAC, like practice SACs and practice SAC questions that aren't grouped by topic. So you can practice questions without actually going in blind 
which is what you're doing in a saccharine exam anyway. So it's the best place to practice. There's other resources out there as well. You can ask your teacher for practice sacks or practice exams. You can go through the um, the Vika website, which is here, and you can go through practice exams. And these are obviously aren't grouped by topics. They're just old exams. So you can go through this and see, okay, like if I can answer a few of these multiple choice just randomly, then um, I should be good. And I don't know what topic they're coming from based on where they are. I have to actually read the information and um, figure out what uh, what knowledge I need. Um, yeah. Don't know where to start or what to do first. Now, when it comes to what to do first, this sounds like a bit of a problem to do with the theory. Because if you see a question, that's just like a textbook type question. Like, for example, if we just go to the start here, like this one here, you should be able to roughly know, you know, what to do to solve for the amplitude and the period for this periodic function. Um, now, I would expect that if you're a master of the theory that that like you wouldn't have a problem with those types of questions and knowing the process for them it'd be more so like let's say if, okay, let's go to the end and see um there's probably some sort of whack application where it usually is okay look at this mess here right find the coordinates of p and q okay so what i can say straight away is that if i'm trying to find p and q i'm looking for the intersection between the function and its inverse i think a function and inverse of the two shapes here or two yeah whatever um, there's two functions here. If I'm trying to find P and Q, I'm trying to find the intersection between them and they also lie on the line of Y is equal to X. So that gives me a lot of information in terms of how to actually find these coordinates P and Q. But a lot of people would see this question and they'll think, oh, how do I find P and Q? It's like an impossible task. But if you just boil it down to saying, okay, if I have a graphical representation of something and I want to find the intersection between two graphs, I just solve those equations simultaneously. A lot of people, that goes a lot of, over a lot of people's heads, which is fair because First of all, they're not exposed to these application problems. And secondly, they're nervous because it's a SAC or an exam, which is completely understandable. So you have to account for stress and nerves when it comes to these types of questions. But the way to reduce your stress and to reduce your nerves, apart from, you know, normal things that we that we do to reduce stress and reduce nerves is by having the confidence. And confidence comes from loads and loads of practice to the point where you feel like you're good. So if you, if you practice enough, then you'll feel like you're good and you will be good. Therefore, you'll be confident. Therefore, you have less stress and less nerves. So that would be my, like a, a big tip of mine as well. It's obviously natural ways to reduce stress. Um, go to the gym, uh, have things, go play sport, get your mind off school. It's not the be all and end all. Um, yeah, all these other ones here, like this, yeah, I'm sure this looks kind of hard, but i um, find this value of N. Um, I'm just trying to think like these questions are pretty hard to look at in first glance and see, okay, like this is how you do that question. Um, but what I'm trying to emphasize is that these questions kind of hide what they need. Well, they, they kind of, they hide what they need to actually solve it. So they're not going to give away, find all the possible values of N in this case. Um, I'm sure there's some sort of condition that needs to be met um, and then find all possible values of N. That's just like very vague. But you have to know what N is based on the question. So it looks like it's going to be some sort of like translation factor. And then um, the possible values of N should satisfy some sort of condition to make this function exist. Like, again, it's hard to say what's actually necessary by looking at the questions just like this. But um, yeah, hopefully what I'm saying does make sense. But I feel like I'm just blabbering a bit. Um, but I feel as if if you do if you don't know what to do first, like as in factorize, take out highest common factor, that looks like some sort of, like you're you're looking for the first step straight away. Actually, I just, I just made a realization now. You shouldn't necessarily think about what to do first as your first like point, like your first part of the thought process, which kind of sounds weird, but you should be thinking about what the end goal is and then working and then working in between that to figure out what's your first step, what's your second step, what's your third step to eventually get to a solution. So whenever I think about how to tackle a question, I think about what my goal is first. And then I work backwards from there. Let's go to an easier question to see if this is possible. Okay. Question one. This is pretty basic. F of X is equal to this. State the coordinates of all axial intercepts of F. Now, let's say if this wasn't factorized, this would be a pretty hard problem, not a pretty hard problem, but it would be, you know, multi-step problem. So the straightaway, what I'll be thinking is that if I need to find my axial intercepts, then I need to factorize. And then I think about what my first step is, which is figuring out how to factorize, which would be, in this case, it's a cubic. So you'd be using your factor theorem or like your remainder theorem or whatever it's called. So that's, that's my thought process when it comes to like this question. Let's say if this was expanded, but because this is not expanded, um, 
it becomes a bit easier. Find the coordinates of the stationary points of F. Okay, straight away, as soon as I see straight stationary points, I'm thinking, okay, like I need to find where my gradient is zero. Therefore, I need my derivative. I need to solve that equal to zero. And I expect to get one and two solutions. One should be negative, one should be positive as my X values, and then corresponding Y values should be positive and negative respectively. That is my exact thought process when I see this question. And I'm already predicting what the question solution should be. And then it's just a matter of working out the specific solution in this case. And and I would just want to point out what I was what I said when I was doing my thought process. I can validate pretty much if my answer is right or wrong. Because if I got a negative X value corresponding with a positive Y value, and a positive x value corresponding with a negative y value, I pretty much confirmed that my answer is going to be right. And it's a pretty easy question for this case, but it's really good. My teacher taught me this in year 10. It's really good to predict what your answer should be, even if it's just an estimation, to know that what you're saying is right. Or to know what, you know, to know that your question is right. It's good to like validate. And your guess is not always right, but you should roughly know, okay, my question, my answer should lie roughly in between there and there. So for example, this is x is equal to negative 1 based on our factorized form. This is x equal to 0. This is x equal to 2. So roughly, this turning point here should be x is equal to positive 1. And roughly, my turning point here should be x is equal to negative 0 0.5. It's not going to be exactly, but if I get roughly those numbers, then I know I'm on the right track or I know I'm pretty much correct. It validates what I'm doing. Again, x minus 2. Find the values of x for which f of x is equal to g of x. Straight away, what I'm thinking is, um, okay, I'm finding my intersection, but I can pretty much just put this straight into my calculator and solve it. It's not too hard. Integrals, we won't talk about that because it's a bit harder and we haven't covered that yet in uh, in March, March 7th. It's a bit early for integrals. But hopefully you get the gist of the thought process I'm going through when I'm looking at these questions. It's a matter of figuring out what I expect my solution to be and then working backwards to see what other steps I need to actually get to that solution.